Here at UBC, as part of an ambitious project involving instructors, students, staff, and talking squirrels, we are developing videos to help you with your writing skills, because communicating science effectively is an incredibly important part of being a good scientist. Today, our old friend and scholarly investigator Grammar Squirrel will consider the importance of using primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. Grammar Squirrel has heard that she should mostly rely on primary sources when communicating science, but she has no idea how to distinguish between primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. By considering three different ways one scientific discovery was reported, we are going to highlight an easy way for Grammar Squirrel and you to do just this. First, meet Hazel Digsbury, as intrepid an explorer as you could ever wish to meet. Not so long ago, Hazel was thrilled to discover a fossil of a new species of mammal while on an exploratory dig. After a lot of hard work at the site of the dig, and back in the lab, and in the library, Hazel realised that this new fossil was that of an ancient relative to the flying squirrel. She wrote up the research in a scientific paper and submitted the article to a science journal. And, sometime later, she was thrilled to have the article accepted and published in the journal. Soon after, Nuts McGavin, a friendly competitor in the field of all things squirrel and fossil related, spent a good deal of time reading dozens of journal articles about flying mammal fossils, including the one that Hazel found, because he's writing a review of the existing literature on the topic. Sometime later, Nuts is thrilled to see his review article published in his favourite science journal. In this article, a lot of attention falls on Hazel's discovery, as well as on similar discoveries made by other intrepid explorers. Sometime later again, a curious would-be paleontologist logs onto Squirrelipedia to learn as much as she can about flying mammals. She makes Squirrelipedia her first choice as a source of information because it has lots of general information, it's easy to understand, and it has accumulated that information from lots and lots of sources. For example, it has the discoveries described by Hazel and Nuts, as well as other less technical information about these flying mammals. So, we have seen three different sources here, and every one of them includes information about Hazel Digsbury's amazing discovery. But how do we tell them apart as being primary, secondary, or tertiary? The good news is that we can do this by asking just two simple questions. As an example, with the help of Grammar Squirrel and her friends, we're going to work through the three different sources we just heard about and distinguish them as being primary, secondary, or tertiary. First, let's look at the journal article that was written by Hazel Digsbury. You know, the one about her own research and discovery. Question 1. Is the content of this article very specific? And by very, we mean very technical, very focused on one topic, and or very much targeted to professionals within its field. OK, great. So now it's time for question two. Did the author or authors do the research? By this we mean, did the person or people who wrote the article actually perform the research themselves? Are they reporting on a specific part of their own work that hasn't been previously discussed in the literature? Okay, great. So that's a yes and a yes for the first source. So let's fill in a little chart. So for the first example, we answered yes to the question, is the content very specific? And yes to the question, did the author or authors do the research? And answering yes to both, we have a primary source. The content is very specific, and the person who actually performed the research wrote the article. Now let's look at the second source, which was the review article written by Nuts McGavin. Remember, it reviewed Hazel's journal article, as well as other journal articles about related research. So, back to question one. Is the content of this article very specific? 
And remember, by very, we mean very technical, very focused on one topic, and or very much targeted to professionals within its field. Okay, great. And question two. Did the author or authors do the research? And remember, by this, we mean, did the person who wrote the article actually perform the research themselves? Are they talking about a specific part of their own work that hasn't been discussed in the literature before? Right, so that's the big difference between Nutz's article and the one written by Hazel. Back to our chart. And importantly, answering yes to the first question, but no to the second, means we have a secondary source. The material is very specific in terms of its content, but someone who didn't actually perform the research or make the original discovery wrote it. And finally, let's go back to the popular, if potentially untrustworthy, Squirrelipedia source. Same old question one. Is the content of this article very specific? Okay, so that's a big difference between this source and the other two. And question two. Did the author or authors do the research? Okay. Another no, or at the very least, an I don't know, which for this purpose is the same as a no. Looking at our chart, it is clear that this is a very different type of source. And yep, you've guessed it, it's a tertiary source. Now that's all been cleared up, you should hopefully be much more confident in deciding whether or not a source is primary, secondary, or tertiary. But if you're anything like Grammar Squirrel and her friends, you might still be wondering why this is important, or, more specifically, why using primary sources is usually preferred in scholarly writing. Perhaps the upcoming example will help explain. Back to our old friend Hazel Digsbury, who is curious to see how far the news has spread about her original fossil discovery. She does a keyword search and finds herself at Squirrelipedia. After scrolling down a little, she finds an artist's impression of the animal whose fossil she uncovered. Only the information is not accurate. Her original discovery suggested the mammal had a little bit of excess skin that might have helped it glide a bit, not dragon-like wings that it could use to terrorise the skies. And after reading on, it becomes clear that the message has been well and truly lost in translation. So, if you'd used this source as the one to provide information for your essay, or whatever you were writing about, you'd not only have been providing inaccurate information, but completely misrepresenting Hazel Digsbury. And this is potentially a huge problem. It's certainly one of the pitfalls of using secondary sources. Although they're an excellent way of getting general information for what's going on in a field of study, you could easily miss out on important details by ignoring the primary literature. For this reason, if you find a helpful secondary or even tertiary source, you should probably head back to the primary literature itself just to make sure that you're not misquoting the original author. You've probably been frustrated and or upset when someone has misquoted you or taken something you've said out of context. And when it comes to academics, it's no different. In fact, misrepresenting a source can even be confused with plagiarism. But if you use a primary source, not only are you guaranteed to be getting material that's very specific and relevant to what you're writing about, it'll also ensure you're getting the information straight from the horse's mouth. Now, there are a few sources that typically fall under the categories of primary, secondary, or tertiary, and these have been listed below for you, just as a general guideline. But remember, with any source, if you just simply ask yourself the two questions we've displayed in this video, it will really help you distinguish between them. Mm -hmm.